Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster and today we are going to be talking about my favorite runway show of all time, Gucci Fall Winter 2018. I am so stoked you do not even understand. I've wanted to make a review video for this runway show for forever. I just didn't want to do it until I actually had access to the runway show notes and I finally got a hold of them thanks to an awesome friend. Once I started digging into those show notes, I realized that we just had an enormous amount of content to cover, so we're gonna be dividing this collection up into part one and part two videos. This week, we're gonna live in the show notes a whole lot. We're gonna read them from beginning to end and kind of talk about the vision that Alessandro Michele is trying to pitch with these show notes. Then next week, we're gonna actually talk about the collection itself and what themes and motifs Alessandro is using to relate back to the very big ideas that he's talking about about in these notes. This is a really big collection of clothes and the runway show is really, really well executed. I strongly advise, as I always do, that you go look at the original video for the collection itself. Despite having an enormous number of looks in the collection, the video really isn't that long. You should definitely check out the one that I linked down in the description because it's really easy to come across some that have been edited for some reason and obviously you want to watch the whole thing. <clears throat> Yeah, this is a lot of looks. There are 90 looks. All right, let's dive in. I'm so excited. Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Gucci is a luxury brand that takes advantage of their absolutely massive budget to communicate with their audience in so many different ways. There's only a few brands in the whole world that we could confidently describe as having built a universe for themselves, and Gucci might be one of the most thorough brands for having done that. In just the few years that he's been appointed as the creative director, Alessandro Michele has been able to fully flesh out his weird, trippy universe in dozens of different ways, including ads that are essentially short films for everything. The smallest release for them warrants a new short film. Parties, pop-up shops, and events, which are basically excuses for them to throw weird Gatsbyan style parties. There was one such party where it was supposedly for a new fragrance release, but at no point did the fragrance ever even make an appearance at the event. After a few hours, all of the fashion writers there were like, I know what's going on here. You guys just wanted to throw a crazy party. 500 worldwide store locations. That is a five with two zeros behind it. The Gucci Garden in Florence, which is not actually a garden. It is a restaurant, a rare and exotic bookstore, and also a shop. They run an experimental short film cinema. The Gucci Art Lab. Countless art books, a release when we feel like it magazine, collaborations with literally thousands of material artisans and artists of all stripes to get these collections put together, to get these stores decorated, to get these events put on, to get all these weird side projects to happen. And of course, not to mention products for men's and women's ready to wear, makeup, handbags, infinite varieties of footwear, optical, suiting and tailoring, timepieces, children's clothes, fragrances, home decor, plus their DIY line. The Gucci universe is a bottomless ocean of storytelling and world building that all rests on the back of their seasonal runway collections. And at the molten core of those runway collections lies the show notes. Let us read. Gucci, fall winter 2018, ready to wear, entitled Cyborg. The challenge of the disciplinary power is to impose a precise identity on the subject. This operation is carried out placing the subject inside binary fixed categories as the normal abnormal one with the specific intent of classifying, controlling, and regulating the subject. The regulative strategies prove so alluring that the subject voluntarily chooses to stick to that particular categorization, claiming its positioning inside a given social structure. In this frame of reference, the regulation of the living body uses the concept of identity as a device of biopolitical control. Okay, so we have a lot to unpack from that, obviously. At the end of that paragraph, you can see that they put Michel Foucault's name. This is not actually a quote that Foucault has in any of his work. It's more of a summary of a general concept that Foucault spent his life defining. Michel Foucault was one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century, and his 
massive body of work can be used to talk about any number of things really. So we're gonna spend some time here kind of defining and honing in how Alessandro Michele is using Foucault to talk about his collection. A lot of Foucault's work revolves around power and a lot of it revolves around norms, especially for our purposes here today, that's mostly what we're gonna be focusing on. One of the core concepts that's most commonly brought up with Foucault is this idea of the disciplinary power. In summary, what this means is that in the past, Kings and monarchs would use their power and exercise it on people in very barbaric and obvious and very public ways. So if, say, the king is walking through the street and somebody yells something mean at him and he doesn't like it, he can turn around and say, kill that man. And his guards swoop in and take that guy to the stocks and they hang him. And this is done publicly for all to see so that everyone may know, do not fuck with the king. As a result of that kind of exercise of power, everyone sees, holy shit, that guy just killed that guy. And even though the person that said the mean thing is dead now, their dead body kind of becomes this symbol that maybe we should rebel. Maybe this guy shouldn't be king. So the hierarchy is there. The king is undeniably more powerful. But at the same time, there also exists these public symbols that allow people to question that authority and rebel against it. But Foucault writes that a new kind of power is being exercised now. Now the power, instead of being done very publicly, is done behind closed doors where no one is able to really look in and see whether or not justice is being carried out. The court system and prisons are an excellent example of this. But even outside of the power structures of being able to execute somebody, this disciplinary power also is heavily applied to the norms that people live their lives by. This is where another Foucault idea slides in that is called the panopticon. Literary theory majors say, hey! I promise this is all important. The Panopticon was a actual plan for a prison system that was laid out around the same time that Foucault was writing, in which there's a giant tower at the middle of a prison. And that tower was supposedly where all these guards were with guns and dogs and stuff. All these ways to enforce discipline on the inmates. And all of the inmates were spread out in a circle around the tower. None of the inmates can see each other, they can only see the panopticon. And that panopticon can see all of them. And so the idea here is that if you always feel like you're being watched by something that can immediately strike with intense discipline, you will self-govern yourself. There doesn't have to be someone in your cell yelling at you and making you sit up straight. You will just do all of these things naturally because you're afraid of the terrible shitstorm that will come if you act up. So with this in mind, let's take this concept back to the actual show notes themselves. The challenge of the disciplinary power is to impose a precise identity on the subject. So we've just learned that the disciplinary power is the more closed in, kind of more contemporary exercise of power, and it's to impose a precise identity on the subject. This operation is carried out placing the subject inside binary fixed categories as the normal abnormal one with the specific intent of classifying, controlling, and regulating the subject. So a lot of contemporary philosophers and critics kind of come back to this idea of knowing about something by studying the opposite and that things kind of can't exist without the tension that's created by having an opposite force kind of forging their mutual identities. In the case of this show, that would be the normal and abnormal. Back in. The regulative strategies prove so alluring that the subject voluntarily chooses to stick to that particular categorization, claiming its positioning inside a given social structure. So I think here it's just saying that being given an identity is often such an easy alternative to having to strike out on one's own and kind of make your own way amongst all of these things that are trying to control you. It's much easier to just accept being a normal person. In this frame of reference, the regulation of the living body uses the concept of identity as a device of biopolitical control. The term biopolitics is another Foucault concept that I don't feel has a ton of relation to these other concepts that they're talking about even in this paragraph. It sounds incredibly cool and I think it kind of helps to underscore to a audience that maybe hasn't read Foucault what they're talking about. But as far as what Foucault actually meant in a literal sense by biopolitical control, I don't 
think that applies here. I could be wrong. I'm not a Foucault expert at all. If anybody has anything to add about the biopolitics thing, I'd love to hear it. Moving right along because it is getting dark. We're no longer doing a summary of Foucault concepts. We're now just fully Gucci speaking for itself and this collection. Identity, though, is neither a natural matter nor a preset category which can be imposed with violence. It's not an immutable and fixed fact, rather a social and cultural construction and, as such, it's a matter of choice, joining, invention. Identity, thus, is a never-ending process, keen on new determinations each time. The consciousness of how everything is socially built, even who we are, opens a field of fresh possibilities to performatively explore. A field of liberty and responsibility in which anybody can become who he or she really wants to be getting social expectations and personal desires back in the game. So here we can kind of see that Gucci is trying to take that Foucault concept and then it sort of applies it very neatly into what their brand is all about, which is, in a word, self-expression. Stuff just to remind everybody that norms of all kind are not welcome in the Gucci universe. Unless you want them to be, and that's okay. Okay, this is gonna kill me, but I'm gonna turn on some interior lights to make this a little bit brighter in here. Ugh, I hate lights other than the sun. How does that look? Terrible? Great, let's move on. The last thing that I do want to point out about this paragraph before we move on is the uh, way that they phrase things at the very end there, where they're talking about this field of liberty and responsibility in which anybody can become who he or she really wants to be. And then they say, getting social expectations and personal desires back in the game. So here they do a pretty artful job of talking about self-expression because they don't just say, literally do anything that you want to do. They talk about the balance that has to come between social expectations, these norms that they were talking about in such a negative way before, balance between social expectations and personal desires. Because Inevitably, everything that we're doing that is self-expressive is a play in some way off of what we are expected to do. Even people out there who are the most purely self-expressive, wild, out there people on earth adhere to at least some social norms of some kind. And I think it's very cool that they're sort of making it clear that that's what self-expression is. They're speaking the name of that tension so that we can better know what to do with it. Back into the show notes. The subjectivities embodying Gucci's pluriverse move in this field, which is ethic and political at the same time. They represent the invitation to diverge, not conforming to univocal and other directed identity models, and the encouragement to spread other ways of thinking about ourselves that are able to violate preset categorizations. Isn't this YouTube channel supposed to be about clothes? Not today, it's not. So the way that they start here is just talking about how this is both ethic and political, which I think just means that it's for you and your personal journey of discovery, but it is also something that should be mandated into law because people shouldn't be allowed to fire people from their jobs because they say they're trans. So the subjectivities of the Gucci pluriverse, which I think just means all of the individual aesthetic elements that make up the runway collection itself. So like, vibes. Moving down to the next sentence, they talk about the show being an invitation to diverge and not conform to other directed identity models. Other directed identity models is a term that is used in queer theory, which is a categorization of the larger literary theory umbrella. Queer here can mean homosexual, the more contemporary use for it, but technically it's referring to the more classical definition of queer, so just meaning other. So it's kind of a sociological study of people who are thought of as different. And while opinions and ideas within queer theory are about as broad as any other field of study, there's one idea that does seem to come up a lot, and that is that othering people is a generally destructive thing to do. So while they're making it clear within the context of this Gucci show that self-expression and being yourself is very good, they are acknowledging that the core tenets of self-expression, things like gender and your sexuality, are not always celebrated as a good, different thing. And I like how at the end of this paragraph, they use the word singularity. To me, it's always really fun when a piece of writing uses a word that has very different definitions and that 
two different definitions from that same word relate to different elements of what they're talking about thematically in the larger piece of writing. And that is just what we have here. We have a uh, triple entendre with the word singularity. One is an unusual trait, which ties into the larger themes of identity. The second definition is one that's more often used in physics, which is a point at which a function takes an infinite value. So the idea of kind of complicating one's identity and not submitting to this idea of normal identity, not a normal identity, just kind of spreading things out and having this diverse spectrum of your identity. And the third definition for singularity that ties us in very neatly into the next paragraph is a hypothetical moment in time when artificial intelligence and other technologies have become so advanced that humanity undergoes a dramatic and irreversible change. Which leads us very smoothly into the Cyborg Manifesto. The collection goes further beyond, taking the shape of a genuine Cyborg Manifesto, DJ Haraway, in which the hybrid is metaphorically praised as a figure that can overcome the dualism and the dichotomy of identity. The cyborg, in fact, is a paradoxical creature keeping together nature and culture, masculine and feminine, normal and alien, psyche and matter. Conflicting with any category grid, the cyborg is the expression that blends different evolving identities. Hybrid and shifting identities built on multiple belongings that transgress the normative discipline. A Cyborg Manifesto was published by Donna Haraway in 1985, and like all pieces of cultural criticism or theory, it is a very complex piece of writing that can be applied to many different things in many different ways. So what we're going to try to do here briefly is identify what pieces of a Cyborg Manifesto we need in order to bring this Gucci collection together. One of the messages of a cyborg manifesto was directed at the feminist community at the time. Some dominant voices in feminism at the time were talking about men and women in these very rubric and strict categorizations. So like saying that men by nature are very domineering and they've set up this hierarchy that is built to suppress us and we have to fight back and kind of overtake the men. What Haraway was trying to point out was the possibility that identity was something that could be forged for yourself. And that especially with all of the advancements in technology, again, remember we're talking in 1985 here, people can select groups to be a part of based on their preferences or affinities. Now here in 2019, we're seeing this idea evolve in some fascinating ways because of the internet. Thanks to infinite connectivity, anyone can take a part of their personality or a piece of their identity and broadcast that all over the world without help from anybody else. Somewhere in another corner of the globe, someone might see in this hybrid identity a piece of themselves that they haven't known how to articulate and better understand who they are. Disclaimer, that is not a summary of a cyborg manifesto. That is one small piece of a cyborg manifesto. Let's get back to the show notes. So in these previous paragraphs where they're expounding upon Foucault's ideas, they're talking a lot about how otherness is something that is very much punished by society. There's all these systems in place to force us to self-monitor ourselves and not be who we really are. Here, once we pick up with Carraway and the Cyborg Manifesto, we talk about how the hybrid is metaphorically praised as a figure that can overcome the dualism and the dichotomy of identity. So in this classic problem that Foucault outlines for us where every time something is faced with its opposite, a natural hierarchy emerges, Haraway comes in and smashes the hierarchy and finds a way for us to merge into a new age of excellence. In the next sentence, they say, the cyborg is in fact a paradoxical creature, keeping together nature and culture, masculine, feminine, normal, and alien, psyche, and matter. So to give an example of such a paradoxical creature, there might be somewhere a guy with a stripper name like Bliss who happens to identify as a man but also paints his nails. And when other people are like, you can't paint your nails, that's a girly thing to do. He would just be like, oh, I guess it kind of is. I don't particularly care about that. And when everybody's like, oh my gosh, you're blowing my mind, you're a guy, and you even say that you're a guy, but you're doing things that aren't guy things, what? Then that bliss fellow would just be like, yes, I am a paradoxical creature keeping together nature and culture, masculine and feminine, normal and alien, psyche and matter. It's true, I do. Final paragraph, stay with me. Gucci Cyborg is post-human. It has eyes on its hands, fawn horns, dragons, puppies, and doubling heads. It's a biologically indefinite and culturally aware creature. 
the last and extreme sign of a mongrel identity under constant transformation, the symbol of an emancipatory possibility through which we can decide to become who we are. So the first sentence there is making reference to the thing that made this show so memorable. And the next sentence when it talks about the Gucci cyborg being a biologically indefinite creature, I think they're just taking some time there to note that while this can be about you choosing to be part of your local punk scene and this is going to be talking about whether people are gay or straight, but definitely also it is talking about the transgendered community. In the next sentence when it says the last and extreme sign of a mongrel identity, I think mongrel in this case just means hybrid or just what they're talking about here, a, a chosen identity. And I love how they end these show notes. The last sentence is so good. It says, the symbol of an emancipatory possibility through which we can decide to become who we are. Saying that the idea of the Gucci cyborg, the casting off of the binaries and the hierarchies and picking up a chosen identity, that that is an emancipatory concept. It is a freeing concept, but that it is a decision. When I was doing all the research for this episode, I came across a lot of cultural scholars who would talk about these ideas from Foucault and then ask the question, what do we do about this? We have these complex systems of power that are enforcing norms on us and it seems to not even be coming from a place. It just seems to be woven into the fabric of life. It's embedded in your own codes and habits. How are you supposed to start to escape from that? And I think that Haraway gives us an incredible solution to that problem. Be a complex person. Live your life, pay attention, self-examine, and accept the paradox of your identity and live your life in a way where you enforce fewer of those norms on other people. This is cool stuff. Good job, Alessandro. Oh my gracious, thank you for joining me. I cannot wait to cover the clothes with you next week. Like, if you thought this shit was cool, wait till we look at these clothes. Please go follow me on Instagram where you can catch daily mood board inspo from my personal photo archive. And go follow me on Twitter because my Twitter is awesome. I am so into you.